It was the time when the Passover was drawing near. It was something that Jesus would regularly do once a year. Jesus with his disciples would engage in Passover. And so on the Passover before his crucifixion, he commissioned his disciples, two of them to go and to find a man that was carrying a pitcher of water to follow him to the house and then ask that man, the owner of the house, if he could make use of that home in which to spend the Passover with the disciples. This was a different Passover. This was a Passover with real meaning, purpose, particularly for Jesus. It was normal for everyone else, for no one else understood. The room was prepared and everything was set ready for the Passover to take place. There was the customary table where the feast would take place. There would be the reclining couches, sofas, where they would lie and chat and communicate. But this time, there was something different. There was something different. There was an empty chair. There was a towel. There was a bowl. There was a pitcher of water. Never been present before at the Passover. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? What's its purpose? What's its place? Well, interestingly, around that, those few items, the most amazing stuff happens. And the record of it is in John chapter 13. When you come to the Gospel of John, in chapter 13, you have travelled two-thirds of the way through the Gospel of John. And all, of, all through that time, up to chapter 13, Jesus is someone particular. He is the Son of Man. He is the servant of man. Some even say the slave of man. He is. And all through the first 13 chapters, you would have Jesus talk about, I am the light of the world. And the next thing he does is he heals a blind man to prove that light is in his hands. And this is the way it was through the Gospels of John. As he talked about the bread of life, he fed 5,000 people to give meaning to what he had been saying. And so all the way along, you have got Jesus saying, this is who I am. And then he would demonstrate it through an act. Through a miracle, through a sign, he would demonstrate who he was. But when you come to John chapter 13, you've come to a very different place. You've come to the place where Jesus puts off being the Son of Man. And as John chapter 13 is the last time you find reference to the Son of Man. And to demonstrate that, he uses this. He uses this. In eastern places at the time of Christ, it was customary for the householder to have a slave gird himself and wash the feet of his invited guests. But it hadn't been done. It didn't happen. There was too much other stuff. 
There's too much other stuff was going on. And Jesus waits. Jesus patiently waits. But nothing happened. So Jesus goes to the chair. Jesus takes the towel, strips off his outer garment and girds himself with the towel. He becomes the slave. He demonstrates who he is by saying, I am the son of man. I am a slave to you all. And so he girts himself with the towel. And then he starts to engage washing the feet of the disciples and gets reaction. Because they didn't really understand that he was the son of man. They were fixated that he was the king of Israel. And no king should do that. Confusion sets in. Confusion reigns. And Peter, being bold, says, Jesus, no, please, don't. And Jesus has a dialogue with him. And Peter becomes the main character of John chapter 13, all the way through it. Yet Jesus is there. And Jesus is significant and very important, but Peter becomes the main subject of John 13. Peter becomes embarrassed. Peter starts to feel guilt, starts to feel remorse. I should have done it. Please, what will he think of me now? And Jesus goes on and washes their feet. And as he washes the defeat, he says something. And he's washed all of their feet. Possibly Judas first, Peter about fourth, and John last. Possibly. He's washed all of their feet. And as he's gone through and he's washed all of their feet, he says, but one of you is unclean. One of you is unclean. And now Jesus does something. Jesus does something, something powerful. The way that Jesus is dressed in John chapter 13 is one of the most significant things about the chapter. Because first of all, he takes the towel and he girts himself like a slave and demonstrates his servanthood to all of humanity. And he washes their feet. But when he's got to do the real business, the real business, he takes off the towel and he puts back on his robe. And at that very moment, there has been a major transition in the life of Jesus. He has said, I am no longer the son of man. I am the faithful servant of the most high God. And that becomes the rest of the discourse for John 13. 14, 15, 16, 17. Powerful, powerful. You know, this morning, I had to do something that I did not enjoy, that I really struggled with. And now I know how Jesus felt. This morning we had a person turn up at our church that is not allowed in the domain of children. Fortunately, we had been warned. Fortunately, we had received information in a letter Upon seeing the person arrive and mention his name, I became suspicious, but I didn't have the document and I had to go home to get it. He would not share me his surname, and that's what made me suspicious. 
So I got the document and I came back and I said, please, tell me who you are. And he wouldn't. He wouldn't. I said, are you so-and-so? He said, yes, I am. What's it got to do with you? And then I had to ask him to leave the premises, to leave the place. Jesus had to ask Judas to leave. Jesus wanted to save Judas. Jesus washed his feet. Jesus wanted to set Judas free. But he was on a course that not even Jesus could change. For when you look in the beginning of John chapter 13, it very clearly tells you that the devil was contending with Judas. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And then it goes on and it tells of the betrayal of Judas. But it tells us of the way in which Jesus asks him to leave. He asked Judas to leave because now he wants to spend time with the faithful, with those who have given their lives to him to teach them what's going to happen in the next little while. What's going to happen in the next 40 days? And so when you come to John chapter 13, you come to a passage in Scripture who many call the farewell discourse. Who likes goodbyes? Do you genuinely like goodbyes? No. They're not pleasant. Many times there's tears when there are goodbyes, especially as your folks get older and more dependent and you have to travel on to go about your business. It doesn't get any easier. By good, saying goodbye gets harder every year because we're all getting older. The insecurity of the world. Every time we say goodbye, we naturally ask the question, will I see them again? Will I see them again? And when you come to John chapter 13, Jesus is saying goodbye. He's saying goodbye to his disciples. He's warned them. He's warned them, open your Bibles to Mark. Open your Bibles to Mark. Mark, we'll go first of all to, if I can find what page it's on. We'll go to Mark chapter 8. Mark 8 verse 31. You know, you've heard me say it before. When there is a trinity of sayings or a trinity of events in the scriptures, you know it's true and it is unchangeable. That trinity of events. And as you journey through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, you find this trinity of sayings. And the first one is in Mark chapter 8 verse 31. To understand the significance of these sayings, you need to know where Jesus is when he says them. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus in a, is in a place called Caesarea Philippi, which is well, maybe 50 k's, 50 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. That's where he is in Mark 8, 31. And notice what he says. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man, notice the phrase, the Son of Man, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said... Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. 
Jesus was being every bit the son of man in humanity, humanity, but acting according to the desires of God. Peter was the opposite. He was the real human. He was being the real human. Hey, Jesus, not possible. You can't do this. When you come now to, to Mark chapter 9, Jesus is now 50 miles south. He's now passing through the region of Galilee. And notice what he does in Mark 30. Mark 9 verse 30. So they went on from there, passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it. So this is kind of secretly happening. For he was teaching his disciples. So he wanted them specifically to himself. He's sharing some important stuff with these guys. He says, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. Three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Yeah. Anybody said goodbye to you that way? <laughs> Anybody come and said to you, look, the way I'm going to leave is I'm going to, I'm going to die. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be crucified. No, nobody says goodbye that way. But this is what Jesus is saying. Hey, guys, I'm going to go. It's not going to be very pleasant, but I'm going to go. Now, have a look at Mark 10, 32. When you come to Mark 10, 32, Jesus is now only a stone's throw from Jerusalem. Okay? And he knows. And as you read the other Gospels, Jesus comes to a place in his life when he's stopped being busy about healing people, working miracles, demonstrating who he is, and he walks to Jerusalem to die on a cross. And when you come to Mark 10, he's close to Jerusalem. He's close to the time of his death, and he says they were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Whoops, scary situation, isn't it? Amazed, afraid. There's stuff going on that is exciting people, but there's stuff going on that's causing despair and concern. Through lack of understanding, fear is part of the community. He took the 12 aside again and began to tell them what was to happen, saying, we are going to Jerusalem. Oops. So these people, these disciples now know that when they enter Jerusalem, what he says next is going to happen. Wow. It's not like saying, when I get to New Zealand, I'm going to see my grandmother. It's not like that at all. Jesus is saying to these guys, to these disciples, hey, when we get to Jerusalem, what I've already told you twice is going to happen, but just in case you haven't understood and you haven't got the message, here it is for you one more time. Verse 33, so we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, they will spit upon him, flog him and kill him and after three days he will rise again. And here you've got Jesus basically reiterating Isaiah chapter 53 where some 700 years earlier, the prophecy of what would happen to Jesus as a human being would take place. And here Jesus, in simple language, is just basically summing up all that the prophecy of Isaiah 53 had said. So for over 700 years, the students of the Word of God would have known that Jesus was coming would have known in Daniel chapter 10, even gave them, Daniel 9, even gave them the dates. They knew that Jesus would come. 
600 years earlier in the prophecy of Daniel, they were told that in the midst of the week, the anointed one would be cut off. And so that anointed one walking the streets of Jerusalem is now saying to the guys, hey, everything told of me back there is going to happen. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. Let's go back to John, John 13. Because we learn something. You know, I learned something beautiful here this week as I, I put some hours into reading and reading and reading about the stuff. And I learned something beautiful. I learned that the, the message of John 14, 15, 16, and 17 comes about because four people ask four questions. That's what brings about the whole of John 14, 15, 16, and 17, is the fact that somebody asks questions. And so, the first questions that the disciples ask of Jesus in the upper room after their feet have been washed, and he has told them that there is one unclean among you, they start asking the question, who is it, Jesus? Who is it? Is it me? Alan White tells us that John was closest to Jesus and was leaning on the breast of Jesus and Peter was a little bit further away and Peter tries to get John's attention and tries to get John to ask Jesus, who is it, Jesus? We want to know. So they're all afraid. They're all afraid. Is it I? And Jesus quickly puts their minds at ease and he says, ah, it's the one with whom I give this piece of bread that I have dunked. That's the one. And then so it is that he gives the bread to Judas and Judas leaves. And Jesus says, hey Judas, don't just leave. Just go and do what you got to do. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. Why was it Judas? Why was it not Peter? We know that Peter sins only a few hours later in a very terrible way by, by not honouring his Lord, by denying his Lord. Why was it not Peter that left? Why was it Judas? Well, we've got the clear message in the Bible. Judas' actions were premeditated. They were premeditated. He had already met with the scribes and that earlier on, and he had planned the activity. Even the gentle touch of Jesus washing away the dirt on his feet could not change his intentions. Even though Jesus was loving him as he loved everyone else, he could not break through. And so because of Judas' premeditated actions, Jesus just said, it's what you're going to do, so just go and do it. I'm not going to be able to change your mind, just go and do it. Now when you come to Peter, it's a very different situation. It's a very different situation. Let's come down. And we will look at, um, what piece will we look at? Yeah, let's go verse 37. Peter said to him, this is John 13, verse 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Good intentions, aren't they? There's 2018 for all of you. <laughs> 2018, you have good intentions, don't you? You're going to do everything right by Jesus. Peter was. Look, Jesus, I'll lay down my life for you. And then Jesus says to him, will you lay down your life for you, for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Jesus was right. Peter was wrong. But Peter did not know that he would be wrong. Peter did not know that that is what he would do. 
It is simply that he weakened to temptation at a moment in his life when he should have been strong. That's us, folks. That's us. We all have good intentions. We all do. But sometimes the devil has the ability to just get in there and mess things up. Mess things up. Let's come to the first question that is asked in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's asked by Peter. Verse 31. After Judas had left, it says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified. It's at this point that Satan is evicted, And that the presence of sin within the community of Jesus is eradicated and taken away. At that moment, Jesus says he is now glorified. He is now set apart in the presence of God and had the right to to exclude Judas. He had the divine right to do that. And so this is what he does. If God has been glorified to him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children. The only other time that this phrase is used in the scriptures is when when Mary is talking to Jesus at the age of 12. Little son, my son, where are you? What's happened to you? You're a little child. You should be with us. And Jesus uses that same language here as he talks to these guys. He says, hey, little children, hey, come on. You haven't grown up yet. You haven't understood what I'm all about. You're still still in the kindergarten. You haven't grown up yet. You haven't understood yet. He says, I am with you only a little longer. Oops, time to stay. start saying goodbye. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. 36. The one who refused to have his feet washed, chips in. Chips in. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Come on, mate, tell me. Where are you going? I want to know. Where I am going, you cannot follow me. But you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I'll lay down my life for you. You can count on me, Jesus. And we know what happens. But that's not part of the story. That's part of another story of what happens to Peter. Let's go to the answer that Jesus gives Peter. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, is an answer to a question that Peter had the courage to ask, where are you going? Are you going back to Galilee? Where where are you going? Jesus, I need to know. I want to go with you wherever you are. And Jesus could sense that they were deeply troubled. So he says to them, particularly Peter, Peter, Peter asked the question, his ears have got to be open wide and really flap and come on, Jesus, what are you going to say? Jesus says to Peter, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Here's an imperative. God was never debated. God was never not part of the equation. But Jesus was. And so Jesus says to Peter, 
If you want to know the place that I'm going to go to, the first thing you need to understand is that I'm on equal footing with God. Oops. The one, I, one who's now talking to you, Jesus, is not the Son of Man. It's now the voice of God. And he's demonstrating that he's been glorified and that he has come to this moment in time where he has put God first in everything. And then he says, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is not talking about buildings with walls and windows and central heating and air conditioning and all of that sort of stuff. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the aspect of being able to abide with God. So he's talking about the context of an abiding place. Jesus is going into the presence of God, is going to abide with him. The same privilege will become theirs. You will again one day be able to abide with with God. And then he says something. Then he says something that triggers a whole lot of emotions. He says in verse 4, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus reminds them that before he can go to that abiding place of the Father, he's got to go somewhere. He's told them three times where that somewhere is. It's the cross. It's the grave and the resurrection. Now they understood. Now they understood. Now they become troubled and deeply concerned. And others are listening. And when you come to verse 5, Thomas chips in. Thomas. Who's Thomas here today? Who's doubting? Who's not believing? Who's not trusting? Who's not confident? Thomas asked this question for all you folks. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? You haven't told us. Oh, yes, I have. Once we get to Jerusalem... I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised up again. Yes, I have. I've told you. And so it is that Jesus just comes back with a very simplistic answer. And he says to Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the life. Hey, it's me. Guys, it's me. I'm your solution. I'm your fix-it man. I'm the one. I'm the way. The fact that truth and life is there is an extension to simply give meaning to what's already been stated. I am the way. That would have been good enough. To the people back then, that would have been good enough. But because we're included in this, I believe... This, this extension has been given because we're so far from removed from the time in which Jesus was there and doing these beautiful things. The element of truth, the element of life is encompassed in that word way. Jesus is everything, unquestionable. Jesus is everything. And so he thinks he's done now. He thinks he's finished now. And then Philip. Philip comes into the thing and says, Lord, show us the Father. Come on. Show us the Father and we will be satisfied. 
A lot of people not satisfied, aren't they? There's a lot of people not satisfied. You know, you can go into Woolworths and you can go to the ice cream counter and you might have 10 people at home and you look at them and say, oh, this person will like this one and that one and that one and you take home 10 ice creams and you still haven't got the right one. People are not so easily satisfied today. Philip wasn't satisfied with what he was hearing. He'd just heard Jesus say, look, I'm going to go and I'm going to make this abiding place for you with the Father. I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And Thomas has asked the question, hey, show her, come on, come on. And then Philip comes along and says, come on, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus comes straight back, double barrel shotgun straight between the eyes. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Come on. What's your problem? I'm God. I'm, Jesus. I'm, I'm demonstrating who God is to you. Verse 9 of 14, Jesus says, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Text is not meaning that we're going to be more powerful than Jesus and be able to do greater miracles than Jesus did. The text simply means because the human family has embraced the ministry of God, much more can be done. Jesus was only one, but now there's millions doing the work of God. And God will not limit that work. That work will be magnified. That work will be multiplied. The next question we have is in verse 22 of John 14. It's a Judas, but it's not Judas Iscariot. And Judas said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? How come? How come, Jesus, you're happy to share this stuff with us? What about the other guys? What about those people out there caught in sin? And Jesus answers this. He says, those who love me will keep my word. And my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. The meaning of that text is clearly demonstrated in what already has gone. Judas was not interested in the message of Jesus. He might have been interested in the money that Jesus helped raise, but he wasn't interested in the person of Jesus. He wasn't interested in the message of Jesus, so he excluded himself. And Jesus says, hey, no point preaching to him anymore. He don't get it. He don't want to get it. But to those who are willing to open their ears, use their gray matter, Oh, Jesus will reach into your lives and Jesus will tell you the beautiful stuff that he's telling these disciples. Did Peter get the message? I want to take you to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And this is where Peter is sharing his heart towards the end of his ministry and he's wanting to have the people to understand what their lives should be and look like. I'm reading from William Barclay's translation. And I'll read first, uh, first Peter chapter 5, verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the glorious crown, which will never wither. So when Jesus comes again, as he has told the disciples, 
He says, we'll be given a crown that will be majestic and beautiful. And then in verse 5, he says, in the same way, you younger men, and I believe we're all here, we're all young. You know, I've got a beautiful little granddaughter, and sometimes I say to her, I'm old, and she says, you're not old, you're young, Pop. Oh, well, I wanted to hang around forever. I don't want her to go anywhere. But in the same manner, you young men must submit to the authority of your elders. <clears throat> Scary thought. That's not submitting to the way I behave. Okay? It's submitting to the way I behave in the presence of Jesus. Better still, it's submitting to the way that Jesus lived in the presence of his Father. Simply fulfilling the will of the Father, not seeking any other desires. All of you, in your service of each other, must put on the apron of humility. Wow. As Peter tries to teach us what to do after Jesus, he takes us back to this moment in time when Jesus put on the apron of humility, the knotted garment, as some people call it from the Eastern culture. He takes them back to that moment. Why? Because Peter, after Pentecost, learned that that was the only garment to wear. The garment of sacrifice. The garment of, of slavery. The garment of service. God is hostile to the arrogant, but favours the humble. So yes, John 14, 1 to 3 is Jesus answering a question that Peter raised. What's your question for Jesus today? What question would you ask Jesus? And I want to challenge you as we embrace 2018 to not be afraid to ask Jesus. And there's a reason I say that and as we close off, I just want to say these things to you. John chapter 13 to 17 is the picture of perfect love. Absolute perfect love. You will not find another passage in scripture where love is so freely spoken of, so majestically spoken of, so beautifully spoken of, and at the same time given so much meaning. The love for the disciples that Jesus has is overwhelming. The love for the Jesus has for the Father is, is just absolutely overwhelming. And as you get to the end of it in chapter 17, yeah, he even prays for you. The love for the world, it's, it's just overwhelming. And this picture of love is only demonstrated because he sees it through to the end. Jesus doesn't give up. Jesus doesn't give up. There is more divorce happening now than ever before. People giving up. It's got too hard. I can't do it. Giving up. Jesus was not about giving up. Love is not about giving up. Love is about holding on. Love is, is about getting through the adversary, getting getting through the challenges. Jesus was and always will be pleasing to the Father. I just want to say to you that Jesus loved to perfection, to completion, and to realisation. Jesus loved no other way. You know, we live in an age where 3D came out, right? And if you're a movie goer, the days of going when it was 2D became boring. 
You wanted life to jump out at you and, and you wanted to be enmeshed in, in life. I can remember the first time I took my grandson to see Ice Age. Oh, he only lasted two minutes with the glasses. It was too real. He couldn't do it. Jesus, I want to say to you, is the 3D picture of God. Okay? He, in every way, Jesus is that picture of God. Perfect. Complete. One thing you learn in John 13, and this is the last thought that I want to share with you. In the early parts of the Gospels, you have Jesus traveling with his disciples. And on two occasions, you have them caught up in storms. Vicious waves, angry winds, a hostile environment. And Jesus comes into the storm and he calms the storm. John chapter 13 through to chapter 17 is about Jesus calming the storm and the disciples and calming the storm in you. That's what John 13 through to 17 is all about. It's about how Jesus calms the storm. And he goes on to say beautiful, beautiful things. And you're going to have to wait till next time I preach to hear what some of those beautiful things are. Trust that God has blessed you today. While the musicians are coming up, if you've seen this book for sale and you have not brought it, I would like to encourage you to do so. It's written by Professor Rob McIver. Uh, I got to know him as a lecturer at Avondale College. And um, he looks through the Gospels and he looks at how each Gospel looks at and Jesus and presents Jesus. A powerful book. It's called The Four Faces of Jesus. Um, well worth the read. And uh, it's exciting. You'll learn some beautiful things of Jesus. Thank you to our musicians and singers. Oh, loving Father, beautiful Jesus. I thank you that you want us to shine, shine in beauty, shine in the richness of your love. We cannot do that without your love for us. We thank you that through this passage of scripture that we looked at, that we've got an understanding of how you loved us because of how you loved those disciples. You just love them. You love them through their difficult moments. You, you tried teaching them. They struggled to understand. But then you spent those moments in the upper room and you laid bare your heart and you taught them about who you really are and what you're all about. And, and I just thank you for that, Jesus. And I pray that the knowledge of that will excite us as we step into 2018. May this be a very sweet year because you are the most important part of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.